Today we're going to have a look at anaerobic respiration. This is chapter 4.6 of your textbook. The key knowledge that you will need for this one is again the location, the inputs and the difference in the outputs of anaerobic fermentation in animals and yeasts. Why would you want to utilise anaerobic fermentation when aerobic respiration produces so much ATP? We've just looked at aerobic respiration and we know that that will produce 30 to 32 ATP. So why on earth would you want to use anaerobic fermentation and not produce anywhere near as much? Well, one reason would be that there's no oxygen available. Remember, oxygen is your final electron acceptor. And if we don't have that available, we can't run the electron transport chain. So if there's no oxygen available, we're going to want to produce ATP still to keep the body running. And our anaerobic respiration and fermentation, so anaerobic respiration is anaerobic respiration and fermentation are processes that occur without the presence of oxygen and they will produce a net of two ATP molecules. It's common in bacterial species, particularly those that live in oxygen poor environments, and some bacteria are even smart enough to switch between aerobic and anaerobic. And these guys are known as faculative anaerobes. Escherichia coli is one of those. E. coli can switch between being anaerobic in your gut to being aerobic when it's outside your gut. Yeast, a unifungular, uh, unicellular fungus, also utilises anaerobic fermentation. Now, in your body, anaerobic fermentation is needed when you need a burst of energy or speed, and your body switches to anaerobic fermentation to supply that energy quickly. Unfortunately, it means that you produce lactic acid. So this is the byproduct of this reaction. And I'm sure that you know what that feels like. You don't even need to breathe to produce this. But the fermentation cannot last more than a few minutes before that lactic acid builds up in the muscle cells and muscle fatigue hits. In bacteria and yeast, Anaerobic fermentation can continue without interruption as long as needed, but in your cells, anaerobic fermentation can only supply ATP for a very limited time. Why anaerobic? Well, it operates A, without the need of oxygen. Remember, that is required for that final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. But without oxygen, we can still supply the cell with energy. It takes place totally within the cytosol of the cell. So remember where glycolysis is occurring? Well, this is it. It produces far less ATP per glucose molecule metabolized than aerobic cellular respiration does. Obviously, without that electron transport chain, we're not generating that huge amount of ATP. It produces ATP, though, at a rate of about 100 times faster than that for aerobic cellular respiration. You think of all the processes in the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and everything that it has to do to actually generate that ATP from that molecule of glucose. There's a lot in there. Whereas with our anaerobic fermentation, it's very quick and easy to get that ATP. So this is one of the pluses for completing this anaerobic respiration. So therefore, we receive more ATP produced per unit of time, not glucose, per unit of time, than aerobic respiration. And it doesn't involve an electron transport chain, so it doesn't need the oxygen as the final electron acceptor. The two most common fermentation processes for anaerobic fermentation are, first of all, glycolysis, occurs and then it splits into two different forms. We've got our animals and our yeast. For our animals, we've got lactic acid fermentation occurring here. And for our yeast, we have our alcohol fermentation. So this is where we produce the ethanol. <coughs> 
There's two, with the two pathways, glycolysis starts with the input of that glucose molecule. So we split the glucose molecule into our two pyruvate molecules. That produces two ATP molecules, which is great, but it also converts two NAD plus molecules into NADH, the loaded form. So as you can see, we end up with the output of two pyruvate molecules. It's the stage of anaerobic resp uh, fermentation that's energy releasing, generating the two molecules of ATP and two loaded NADH coenzyme molecules. It is, as you know, identical to the, the glycolysis pathway. So you've seen this before. This is our glycolysis pathway in aerobic cellular respiration. It doesn't need oxygen. And it occurs before we then pop this into our Krebs cycle. There's a short add-on stage. And this is sometimes referred to as fermentation or NAD plus regeneration. The NAD plus regeneration is extremely important for this process. Without it, everything would stop. So it starts with the pyruvate molecules. It doesn't generate any rich, energy rich products when it does this. And it ends with different outputs depending on the enzymes present in the cells involved. So let's say animals, you get lactic acid and yeast, you get ethanol. So that's your two different outputs. It enables the unloaded NAD plus to be formed again, and that lets them be recycled back in and loaded again for glycolysis. Without that unloading of the NADH, if we left it as NADH, we would build up NADH in the cell, and therefore we'd have no NAD plus to continue glycolysis. And again, the cell is going to die if it doesn't have NAD plus, free NAD plus to be able to use in this process. Lactic acid fermentation. So here we're looking at the lactic acid pathway. So this is in humans. And the add-on stage is a one-step reaction and it's catalyzed by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And this is what produces the lactic acid. So if we left it at the pyruvate stage here, we would have two NAD H here and we'd have nothing left to provide this 2 NAD plus to become 2 NADH as this occurs. So we would not be able to produce any more ATP if we didn't have any NAD plus available to the cell. So this second pathway here is in order to break that back to NAD plus so it can then go and be fed back into the system here. Without this step the lactate dehydrogenase, the cell would stop working. So we've got our pyruvate and we form lactic acid. So here's our pyru pyruvate and we're going to form lactic acid here. That is not correct. That should have a three there. So that should have a little three in there. We'll have to edit that later. Our alcohol fermentation, on the other hand, we've got ethanol produced and that's produced in a two-step rea reaction this time. So we've got our pyruvate and we're using pyruvate decarboxylase. We're producing 2-acetylaldehyde and then this is where our NAD is converted back into NAD plus to convert our acetylaldehyde into ethanol. So this is a two-step process here and we're then producing our NAD plus to come back into the system here. We also produce carbon dioxide in this system here during the process. And we use this carbon dioxide, especially if we're looking at producing a fizzy drink. So let's say a champagne or something to that effect. We actually utilize the carbon dioxide to pressurize the bottle as this fermentation process occurs. So that's what creates our fizzy um, fizzy sorts of drinks like our champagne. All right, you do need to know your inputs and outputs. So for your anaerobic fermentation in animals,
We've got glucose as an input. We need our 2 NAD plus and our 2 ADP plus our 2 PI. They are then converted to the products of lactic acid, 2 NADH and 2 ATP. Our anaerobic fermentation in yeast, we've got our glucose, 2 NAD plus and 2 ADP plus 2 PI. Our outputs here, instead of our lactic acid, we've now got ethanol and CO2. Our NADH and 2 ATP stays the same. Remember, our NAD plus is continually recycled. Really important. NAD plus needs to be regenerated. That loaded form of NADH needs to be unloaded back to NAD plus. So that whole regeneration process must occur. Without which, as I've said, the cell will actually quickly die. So if we don't convert that NADH back to NAD+, the cell will very quickly die. Yeast, just a reminder, yeasts are unicellular fungi that typically reproduce by budding. We have various different yeast species and within one species, different strains or variants are recognized. So there's lots and lots of different species of yeast and within that species, we have different strains of the same species. A widely studied yeast is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and it has several strains. We've got baker's yeast, so this one over the left here, and you've probably seen that in your kitchen. Uh, very common if you make breads or pizza dough or anything like that, you will have some of this in your kitchen. And we've also got brewer's yeast. Now, this is probably unlikely for you to have in your kitchen unless you're um, keen on brewing alcohols and beers and things like that, you're unlikely to have this one, but we also use that as a booster for um, um, you know, some health benefits and things like that as well. So this one here plays a big role in brewing beers and wine making and things like that. Baker's yeast and brewer's yeast differ in the relative proportion of alcohol and carbon dioxide they produce. You cannot make bread with this yeast, and likewise, you can't make wine with this yeast. So they're specific for each one. If you have a look here, I've got some other ones here. This one here is for making champagne. So this is a champagne yeast, and specifically produces quite a lot of CO2, this particular yeast. We've got this one here is a sake yeast, so for making sake, and it's a particular yeast that will produce quite a high alcohol content. And this one here, this White Labs produces a whole range of different yeasts. You can see the different colours here. They're all different yeasts for different purposes. So these are all based on the same sort of yeast, but they're different strains of the Saccharomyces yeast. All right, just a table showing you the, the comparison between aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic fermentation. You can see here we've got the requirement for oxygen. So aerobic means air, you need oxygen. Anaerobic means no air. So anaerobic is literally translates to no air. And so we've there got, therefore got no air fermentation or no air respiration. So we don't need air for that one. It's mainly plants, animals, fungi, protozoa, and many bacteria use aerobic cellular respiration, but for anaerobic fermentation, mainly fungi, bacterial, and skeletal muscle for a very short period of time. So when you exercise or run or do a quick sprint, that's your skeletal muscle that is using anaerobic fermentation to get quick, fast energy, but of course it doesn't last very long. Number of stages, we've got three stages, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain for our aerobic. For anaerobic, we've only got two stages. We've got glycolysis, plus we've got the short stage to convert that NADH back to NAD+. So whether that be lactic acid or whether that be ethanol, whatever stage that is, it's got to convert the NADH back to NAD+. We've got the presence of an electron acceptor here, but none in this one. 
our inputs, we have both glucose and oxygen here, uh, but this one here, we've only got glucose. Our end products, we end up with carbon dioxide and water here. And for this one, we've got various different end products, including ethanol, lactic acid, carbon dioxide, just to name a few. Our energy yield is very high. So remember, this is the theoretical value from your textbook. Remember, we're looking at 30 to 32 ATP for our actual yield. This one here is very low. We only get two ATP for this one here. Our rate of ATP production, well, because this one's got to go through so many different steps, it's a lot slower, but higher yield. This one here is very quick. It just goes bang, 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 and it's done. The location, we've got both the cytosol and the mitochondria, but with this one here, we've just got the cytosol of the cell. So our aerobic cellular respiration, this is our ATP producing pathway that occurs in plants and animals and many microbes, including pathogenic bacterial species. As I've said, it has to have that electron transport chain and it needs that acceptor. So we release energy from electron transport between a donor and acceptor in the chain. We can only allow that to occur if we have oxygen that finally accepts the last electron. So that oxygen has to come from a, an external source to accept that final electron. And that's, there we go, terminal electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. And as it does so, it forms water. So some of those hydrogen ions bond with the water, uh, sorry, bond with the oxygen to form water. It produces most of its ATP in the electron transport chain. So about 70% of the ATP produced is in the electron transport chain. And as you know, that's quite a lot. It has a high yield, high energy yield of about 30 to 32 ATP molecules in ideal conditions. So not theoretical, in ideal conditions for each molecule of glucose that undergoes aerobic cellular respiration. In comparison, anaerobic fermentation is the process of making ATP using energy from the breakdown of a variety of organic molecules such as glucose. It does not require oxygen and it occurs in fungi such as yeasts, skeletal muscle during strenuous exercise and in several kinds of bacteria. It has a very low total energy yield, so as low as two ATP molecules for each molecule of glucose that is fermented. It produces ATP without the involvement of the electron transport chain, so thus we do not need that final electron acceptor. So it's just the comparisons between aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic respiration and anaerobic fermentation. We did used to call this anaerobic respiration, but we've now renamed that to anaerobic fermentation. So um, just keep that in mind. All right, so short topic that one. Uh, if you could have a look at your biozone number 55, so measuring respiration, exercise 4.6 from Learn On. And make sure you have a look at Ed Rollo, so 6B, and again, the links are in the class page for you. So 6B, anaerobic fermentation on Ed Rollo. All right, thank you.